Hello, everyone. Hey there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda. You're, listen- you're listening to. I don't, I don't know, know her. her. <laughs> There's a little hitch in our getting yeah, up right we there. We were not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> this is the podcast where we talk about women you've probably never heard of, but you should have. And now you're going to learn some things today. Mm-hmm. I hope. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rita, tell me what you want to talk about. I just texted Amanda, I think a couple days ago, and I was like, can we talk about body hair? <laughs> Body hair. What an interesting topic. Yes. Last week, naked selfies with your friends. This week, (laughs) body body hair. hair. (laughs) Tell me about it. What do you want to know? I had an experience where, so I don't shave my armpits. And um, when I'm at work, I usually wear like a tank top with like a button up shirt over it. Mm -hmm. It had gotten really busy and I was really sweaty. And I sat down because I was done. And um, I was talking to a regular of mine. And she... I took off my shirt and went to put my hair up and she was saw my armpits and was like, whoa. And I was like, oh yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't shave my armpits. And she's just like, oh, I don't think I could do that. And I was <laughs> like, why? She goes, I don't know. She's like, I'm a woman. I just don't. And I said, uh, and I'm not. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I wanted your, I wanted to hear what you had to say about that comment, but I'm a woman. And I was like, well, so am I. Well, that person obviously follows some pretty prescriptive things about what makes a woman a woman. I, I'm, I'm actually quite curious. I know I read it somewhere about when women started, started shaving, shaving their armpits because it wasn't like a thing until the 20th century. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's been an age-old tradition. I, I mean, I personally, that's the only thing I shave. Really? For you? Yeah. It's the only thing I shave because... Um, when I sweat a lot, when I, when I grow it out and I sweat a lot, it drips oh. down my oh. side and I really get grossed out by like the wet hair feeling. Yeah. Ooh, I hate it. I could imagine then. Yeah. That would feel a little weird. Yeah. So I do not shave them, especially when I'm training a lot. Like in the winter, I'll often let yeah. it go for days at a time because who cares? Mm-hmm. In the summer though, when I'm training a lot, it also, um, sometimes will chafe when I run. Really? Oof. I've gotten that before. Yeah, but it was when I had shaved shaved armpits. Yeah, I think it can go either way. Some mm-hmm. people, that skin-to-skin contact is what causes the problem, the friction of your skin on your skin, like sweaty skin. But um, for me, that the body hair, just the dripping feeling mm-hmm. was just too much. I couldn't take it. Yeah. I just, I felt, because when I said, and, and I'm not, you can see in her face that she was like, oh, shit, I, I made a whoopsie. And she's like, oh, I just meant like personally for myself. I I don't. Yeah. I don't like the feeling. And I just could see the back pedaling. <laughs> oh, for sure. And uh, I was like, well, I was like, it's just, it doesn't really matter to me. And it doesn't really matter to my partner. And so why? Why would I, you know? I think the whole body hair thing is such a, for me, I thought, oh, well, in my, maybe my teens and 20s, it was a big deal. But as mm-hmm. I got older, I felt like there were a lot of people who did what, you know, like grew out whatever Mm -hmm. because they just don't feel like it. Because those ideas about like maintaining your body hair, those are really antiquated to me. Really? I mean, that's like, I don't know. To me, it's like, okay, well, it's not, you know, the we don't have to live up to these like unrealistic beauty standards that have nothing to do with our health. Like, that's the thing I do remember is that the only time I can recall there being a reason to keep your body hair short Mm -hmm. was um, way back in the day when, uh, like, body lice was a really big problem. And so um, sex workers would often shave their body hair, armpits, vagina. Just to maintain. Yeah, just to make sure that they didn't have lice. Hmm. I didn't think about that, yeah. And like, if, if you're worried about having lice, by all means, like <laughs> keep it shorn. But like, if, if that's not something you want to do, then yeah. I don't think you should be in any way feel obligated to do it. Mm-hmm. If you want to do it, cool. It's your body. I remember it was, it was almost like a must for me and my sisters because being Latino, it was super, it was thick and it was noticeable and we would get like made fun of because like our eyebrows were really thick. I had sideburns when I was born <laughs> <laughs> and like I had pretty serious arm hair. 
And I remember being made fun of for that. Mm -hmm. And I bought like a wax kit and I was probably like 10, maybe nine or 10. And I was trying to do this wax and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I had like, I ripped some of my skin off and it it was a horrible experience. And so it was like always like almost like a point of shame for me to like get rid of the arm hair and get rid of the facial hair and get rid of everything. And so now I kind of embrace it a little bit more. I still pluck out my chin whiskers. Like I'm not going to let that (laughs) go. For me, I get, I get like two of them and it's, I had, I was playing hockey when I was a kid and I got hit with a hockey like I was guarding oh. I was guarding and I got hit with a hockey stick when a kid went to um actually strike and his follow through went all the way up to my face and cut open my chin oh and there's this tiny little scar there and there are like these very very dark thick black hairs that shoot out of the scar <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like you know that's a no thanks for me <laughs> <laughs> If I had a little goatee, maybe I'd be okay. But it's just like three, two or three terrible wiry hairs. <laughs> I, I don't like those. I get rid of those. Yeah. I just, uh, it, it's, it was kind of fun for me to defend it as an adult instead of bend to it, mm-hmm. bend to a standard that I used to as a child. Oh, for sure. When I was a teenager and in my 20s, I did everything possible to get like no body hair. And I had a little bit of a mustache too because I remember seeing I think you should post it the photo of you as a kid with your (laughs) sweet mustache (laughs) it was pretty righteous (laughs) it was pretty it it was was noticeable like you said that you had one and I was like oh that's probably one of those things I've heard people exaggerate and I saw the picture and I was like oh though that's for real oh that's a stash (laughs) that's a real mustache But uh, like it's more than most of the kids I know can grow right now. Mm, right. <laughs> but I, I used to have a little bit, especially like when I was like going through puberty, mm-hmm. I would have it on the edges. And when I would wear makeup, it looked like I had taken a paintbrush and painted them black. Really? Yeah. When I wore makeup, especially. Mm. So then I started bleaching them. Oh, I, yeah. I bleached my mustache. Oh, and the things we did in the 90s. Like right. the over plucking of the eyebrows. I still only have half an I eyebrow never on one side. Over plucked. Thank God. Thank God. Cause I would look a little weird right now. <laughs> but um like I, I just I wanted to talk to you about it because I didn't know if you had the same kind of background with body hair that I did. Well, I think I had an advantage. I had a privilege of having pretty light colored body hair. Um so I mostly got away with just because I stopped shaving my legs 20 years ago. No, really? no, about 15 years ago. Yeah. I usually just don't shave in the winter time. Yeah. I stopped altogether while I was still married to my ex-husband. Wow. Yeah. That was a long time ago. It was literally like 2005, <laughs> 2006. And I will have to say my underarm hair is rather shocking. It's not like that cute, like little hippie, like a little tiny streak of hair. <laughs> it's full on motherfucking black curly hair. <laughs> I I just don't think there's anything weird or strange about body hair in general and definitely not armpit hair. I'm like, I always think like we have weird body expectations for women that we don't have for men. And whenever I examine that, I Hmm. just don't find there to be a real thing there. Why is it okay for men to have armpit hair, but it's not for women? Mm -hmm. And I, facial hair. And those same people that think that women should shave their armpits. Imagine if there was a man who shaved his armpits, what they would say. Oh, I didn't think about that. They'd be real weirded out by it. Yeah. The only men I know of who get away with like shaving a lot of their body hair off and are widely accepted as being okay mm-hmm. is uh, people like swimmers. Yeah. Bodybuilders. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Pretty much. Yeah. And I, I, I just think like, well, whatever suits your body preferences, whatever you care for, like, that's what you should do for yourself. And it's not my business. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody looks great. <laughs> I'm really working on just being like, everybody looks great exactly as the way they want to present themselves. Mm-hmm. If they feel comfortable. I mean, I, I just think that everybody who feels comfortable in their own skin and walks out of their house feeling confident and handsome or beautiful or whatever they want to use their adjective 
then it's going to show and I'm going to accept every choice they've made because obviously that's what led them to this Mm -hmm. place of comfort. I think part of the experience too was just the acceptance I feel like I have with myself now. I know. Which is, it took a lot of work. It's It's still not all the way there, but it is groundbreaking. The fact that even that I took off my shirt and I wasn't even aware of the fact that, oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't um, lift my arms up. Like that to me is like I was in a natural state. And I was like, yay, it's like a tiny win. I I love that you were able to just say directly back to her, and I'm not a woman. Yeah. And check it. (laughs) And I think that especially as we move towards a world and a society in which we understand that there are, there is no one definition of what it is to be a woman or a man. I think that especially because we're understanding that there are things that are not female or male there are things that are non-binary and you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. we are having this moment where we're understanding that the depth of the human experience is far greater than we had perhaps been told Mm -hmm. and I think that as we do that we're going to be able to strip away some of those really prescriptive ideas of gender Mm -hmm. and it's gonna be great awesome I'm proud of you (laughs) I'm proud of me too and There's for actually, anybody out there, do what you want to do. It's your body. I agree. Do it. Do what makes you comfortable and happy in your own skin. That's really the best thing you could do for yourself. I agree. There's one thing I wanted to address because I was thinking about it, and I just wanted to make sure I said it to you personally out loud. What is it? When we were talking, so we mentioned last week on the podcast that we had been interviewed for the Art Hour. Mm-hmm. Um, which you can, again, you can find that online on Anchor or on the KYRS website. And we had been asked, I think, I think it had been Mike who had asked about, maybe it was Eric, I can't remember, had asked like how the idea of the podcast came up and stuff like that. And Mm. Rita was extremely complimentary about how I had like helped shape how she told stories and all this stuff. And I just sort of nod along, but I, (laughs) I think like you don't give yourself enough credit for the work that you've put into making this a good show for people to listen to. Oh, I appreciate that. So I just want to tell you, you're doing a great job all on your own. (laughs) Oh, shucks. (laughs) Okay. Do I go first today? Yeah, I went first last week, I believe. Okay. Who do you have? I have... Margaret McFarland. I don't know her. She was a child psychologist whose teachings influenced generations of children and helped create the most beloved children's program in the United States. Oh, okay. You ready? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about Margaret Beale McFarland. She was born on July 3rd, 1905 to Robert and Gertrude McFarland. She was the youngest of three girls. How many girls are in your family? Four. I'm the youngest of four. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I I don't think they had any boys either. It was just girls. Oh, geez. Lots of hair pulling. Yeah. (laughs) Their family lived in a pretty nice home. Um, You know, they were like an upper middle class family. They lived in a suburb of Pittsburgh called Oakdale. When Margaret was just five years old, her father died. Oh. And this event changed her life. I can imagine. It not just like in the way that you think of a parent's death changing you. It really just altered her entire perception of reality. Mm. Um, Later, she said that this was the single most important event in shaping her personality and her career path. Wow. And this is what she said about losing her father when she was so young. All of the subsequent phases of what it means to be loved by a male and loving to a male were lost to me. I wanted a kind of fathering. Oh. Yeah. So basically she couldn't have a healthy adult relationship with a man Mm -hmm. because she just, there was this piece of her missing that she kept looking for. It had been shattered. Yeah. And she also, because she lost him so young, had sort of idealized him Mm. and he became like a prince in her mind or a knight in shining armor. I've actually heard um, that that usually happens. They become idolized. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking about that. Um, I'm sure you heard about Harry Harry and Meghan. Oh, yes. They uh, left the crown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And one of the things he cited was that the media in Britain was so terrible to his wife and he didn't want to see what happened to his mother happen to his wife. That would be an, a genuine fear. Right. Yeah. And I thought about like, she was already really idolized in life, Princess Diana. And when her death happened, I mean, he was 13. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine after that, like, you already had the, the loss of the mother, but but then at the same time, like everybody in the world <laughs> idolized her and loved her mm-hmm. and mourned her. Yeah. And so, I mean, you talk about that like idea for this regular woman. Mm-hmm. I mean, the pedestal he probably had his mom on was pretty significant. Mm-hmm. So I think it really affects how you view the world. And in his case, he's willing to sacrifice his entire like connection to his family in order to make sure that what happened to his mother doesn't happen to his wife. Yeah. I, which was great. Yes. And I think it's a big fuck you to the royal family. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, however, she ended up being really close to her mother. So Margaret recalled that her mother was really invested in motherhood and made sure her daughters felt safe and loved throughout their lives. Oh, that's lucky. Mm-hmm. When she asked, when she was like a little girl, when she realized what birth was, like how birth happened, she asked her mom if giving birth to her was painful. And her mother told her she couldn't remember any pain. Mm. And that Margaret said that as a young child, this gave her a sense of worth, of self-worth that like, because, you know, I think you know that it's painful. Yeah. Like you're, you're asking the question, not because you want the answer about pain, but you want the answer about you. Mm-hmm. And her mom was like, I don't remember any pain with you. And there's actual yeah. science to back that up. That's interesting. There's science to back up the idea that um, that the euphoria after that comes after birth erases the memory of the pain oh. of both the pregnancy and the birth. Because otherwise, um, mothers would reject their children. Really? If they if they associated their baby with the pain. I just remember when Isai came out, it all, I didn't feel anything because it was all about, it was all him. Yep. And it was that moment of, you know, he's laying on my chest and it was, it was just us. Yeah. That's the euphoria. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's science behind it. So wow. her mom really. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Because otherwise, again, moms would reject their children. Kick the bird out the nest. Um, Margaret also remembered that her mother was the one who instilled in her that there's great power in giving to people. And she acknowledged that the that there was hard work and sacrifices that people make in order to improve your life. And so she wanted to teach Margaret that. So Margaret said this about her mother. Years ago, my mother would make Christmas goodies and put them in baskets for me to deliver. I think I was about eight when my mother packed a big basket of cookies for the telephone operators. I thought it was quite an exciting and important mission to deliver that basket. (laughs) To let those operators know that even though we never saw them, we did appreciate them. Oh, that's so lovely. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So Margaret started babysitting when she was a teen, and this is when she started to become really fascinated with how children started to learn things and how they related to their parents, their mothers and their fathers, and how they started relating and reacting to the outside world. And she was really good at observing. That was like Mm. her key quality. And we actually talked about that last week with um, Kate Warren. Oh, yeah. That she said, you know, women are keen observers. They see things that other people don't see. And that's really what Margaret was really talented at. She could watch an interaction and start to understand what was really happening between these people without them really even understanding. Hmm. And so she knew from a young age that what she really wanted to study was child development, which is pretty cool. Very. Yeah. Margaret was really inquisitive and intelligent young girl. And so it was no surprise that she got into Goucher college, Hmm. which was then a very prestigious women's college And she graduated from her undergraduate degree in 1927 and then went on the very next year to get her master's degree at Columbia. Oh, wow. Columbia. Columbia. (laughs) (laughs) After completing her master's, she then spent a few years teaching and doing personality research in Pittsburgh and Illinois. And actually, when she was in Illinois, she partnered with two women who were working on research into art therapy for children. Oh, that is fantastic. And that is the second time that's come up for us. Yeah. 
And I am beginning to think that maybe I should seek out art therapy because I've been talking about on the podcast about how doing things with my hands has been helping my anxiety. Yeah. And I'm like, maybe I should start. This is like keeps coming up for me. And I'm like, (laughs) maybe maybe it's a sign that I should look into it. Uh, So she returned to Columbia after she'd been doing this research and decided to get her doctorate. Um, She entered the teacher's college there and got her doctorate in childhood development. So after she graduated in 1938 with her doctorate, she moved to Australia, where she trained kindergarten teachers as the principal for the Kindergarten Training College of Melbourne. Wow. And then she, um, after she left the kindergarten training college, she went and served as the executive director of the Free Kindergarten Union in Victoria, Australia. The Free Kindergarten Union? Yeah. Interesting. I, I, I guess they had free kindergarten? I don't I, know if that went... I would, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, it didn't go into that. But um, so she uh, directly took what she had learned about how to work with young kids and then was teaching teachers how to interact with oh, young kids. Great. So when she returned to the U.S. in 1941, she became an associate professor of psychology at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. Um, she had originally thought that she was just going to work directly with children. Mm-hmm. And what she really found is that she liked to work with the people who worked with children as well. So she would usually work with both of them at the same time. Okay. Very in depth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was during this time that she also developed, started to really hit on how much of a part women played in the development of children, especially mothers, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of her work for most of her life ended up being on like the roles that parents play and specifically that mothers play in the development of their children. And she spent 10 years observing mothers and children. That's a long ass time. (laughs) Yeah. And that's when she decided after that, that she wanted to go back home to Pittsburgh and she ended up moving back into her childhood house. Um, I'm not sure when her parents died, so I'm not sure if that was the catalyst for her coming back, mm-hmm. maybe, to like take over the house, or maybe one parent died. Well, I, obviously her father is already dead, so I don't know if like her mom was dying or sick Needed or something. Needed help. Or... But for whatever reason, she decided to go home, and she went to her house that she had grown up in. And she decided to start working at Pitt, University of Pittsburgh where they were um, having, like, Pittsburgh as a city was at that point having a real big renaissance of art, uh, academics, and medicine. Interesting. And medicine still to this day is a real big field there. And they're also in the middle of a second renaissance. Nice. Because as I've mentioned before, my wife's from Pittsburgh. (laughs) So I know a lot about it. And she's very excited about this episode. I didn't tell her who I was talking about. I just told her that (laughs) that she was from Pittsburgh. So she began teaching in the Department of Psychiatry, or Psychiatry, not Psychiatry. I did this last week, too. I could not remember the word assassin. Assassin. So I said assassinator. <laughs> I felt such an idiot when I listened back. I was like, Amanda, it's assassin. In any case. We need to make a ledger of all these words that we cannot say. Yeah, and I was listening back also, and I realized that you say pillow. <laughs> pillow. 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 Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) So in any case, she's working at Pitt at the medical school. And there she starts um, to work with two men who are really big in the field. Uh, One is named Benjamin Spock, which I was like, real? Okay. So you're literally Dr. Spock. Spock? (laughs) And then Eric Erickson, again. Really? These names are- Is that the Dr. Spock that wrote the book? About Child, children? Yes. Child rearing? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. So they became extremely famous, well-known people in child development, child psychology. Yeah. Um, but she was their equal. Wow. And she just didn't like fame. So nobody knew who she was. Ugh. So together, the three of them founded the Arsenal Family and Children's Center in 1953 in Lawrenceville, which is an area of Pittsburgh. Their goal was to bring in physicians and other professionals who would be able to learn about how child development should go. Mm -hmm. And Margaret was super key in developing the curriculum that they used there. And their stated goal was developing curriculum that helped children reach their full potential and uniqueness. (laughs) Nice. And um, one thing about 
these guys is that they like they met her and they saw how she taught and they were like you're incredible nice and that's why they wanted when when the idea of creating this family and children's center came up they really wanted her to be i mean it wasn't like any just because they were more famous it didn't make a difference to Mm -hmm. them they knew she was vital yeah he was super well known because as you mentioned he wrote this very famous book on family and parenting Mm -hmm. which became one of the biggest bestsellers of all time Mm -hmm. and eric was similarly well known he was the first person to explicitly lay out what the stages of child development are he like did writing on it, and so people knew what it was. He also is the person who coined the term identity crisis. Really? <laughs> mm-hmm. So he's super famous. They both are. But Margaret was like really good at teaching everyone. So one day she pulled him aside, and she was like, Eric, <laughs> if the reader is to understand science, the writer has to love the reader. Love is an essential component in all understanding. Yikes, that's deep. Yeah, so he was like, okay, uh, I'll redo it then. And he did. He like rewrote the stuff he was writing so that his reader would feel that he cared. Mm. A little bit of a woman's touch there. Mm-hmm. Um, they both considered her to be one of the most incredible teachers who ever lived. And her focus on love being s- central to any kind of learning became one of their tenets of the work at Arsenal. And she directed it. She was the director of the Arsenal program. Very cool. For a long time. At the same time as also teaching. And it was this unique direction toward understanding and valuing love that made Margaret McFarland uh, an extremely revered teacher by every student she ever had. She often brought in, when she would teach, she would bring in a mother and a child for her students to observe. And they would just like hang out and do mother child things. Oh God, I would not want anybody to observe me with these. I know, isn't that, it would, I was imagining that. I was like, (laughs) so I don't know if they were like in a classroom and the two of them just sat there at the bottom of the steps or something, or if it was like in an enclosed room with a two-way mirror situation. Mm, Where they feel more comfortable. Yeah, Yeah. where it's like, oh, it doesn't feel like anybody's watching you. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm not entirely clear on that, but this would happen. They would bring in a mother and child. These students and her would watch them interact. And uh, afterwards, the class would spend like two and a half hours discussing what they'd seen. And the students would say that like she would be able to distill the entire experience. Like she would be able to like look at the way that they were interacting and be like, do you see the way that the child is looking at her, you know, her mother right there? That is that's this uh, sense of wonder or this child is really trying to discover something like she would just be able to know what was really happening. Mm -hmm. And if a student wasn't understanding something, she always told a story that would encapsulate the lesson without ever like explicitly telling them it would, she would gently lead them to where she wanted them to understand. Interesting. And in the 1950s, she became one of the most sought after experts in the field of childhood development and psychology, which is why she was asked to work as a consultant and supervisor at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. So this was a totally different college. It's a private college that creates ministers, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. where you go if you want to become a minister. But a lot of their students would also want to do something else. Like they wanted to be a minister, but also a counselor. So they would partner with the University of Pittsburgh, which is how she ended up supervising some of their students. Okay. And one of those students was in was trying to uh, also go into counseling, and he his name was Fred Rogers. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Rogers was immediately drawn to McFarland's methods of teaching, which often involved gentle questioning that would lead students to epiphanies that they felt they got on their own. And so they would always feel a sense of ownership in how they understood something. And her love-centered approach also appealed deeply to Fred's own belief that kindness and love should be at the center of all human interactions Mm -hmm. and relationships. So one of the first tasks she put forward to him was to get in touch with his own childhood memories and feelings. Her go-to phrase was, anything human is mentionable and anything mentionable is manageable. Interesting. 
So in a sense, what she wanted folks to know, especially students, was that all, and children, really, all feelings, even big ones or scary ones or things you don't want to face, should be talked about. And once they are talked about, once it's out in the open, it's easier to deal with. That is amazing. (laughs) We actually, you and I have had that exact conversation. Yes. About like scary things that we're not ready yet to talk about from Mm -hmm. our past. Once they're out in the open, they just are less scary. (laughs) They are less scary. Yeah. But the the idea of getting to the place where they're not scary is is itself scary. Is yeah, <laughs> it's a vicious <laughs> cycle. So anyone who's a fan of or has seen Mister Rogers' Neighborhood knows that this was a common theme on his show that kids should acknowledge their feelings, be okay with their feelings, um, and also to talk about really big, scary experiences like divorce. Or war. Mm-hmm. So kids were always allowed to have that same exposure. Mm-hmm. Or maybe even like death or. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, death, disability, differentness, stuff like that. When Fred was a student of Dr. McFarland's, he was co hosting a children's sh- television show called The Children's Corner. And it was filmed in Pittsburgh. And most of the work he did, though, was puppeteering. And he was not on screen as often. Dr. McFarland agreed to meet, start meeting with Fred because he really wanted to have one-on-one time with her. And, and she was pretty taken with him. She thought he was a really good soul. Hmm. And she described him as not being afraid uh, of being able to like access his childhood and that he wasn't like a lot of men where he didn't repress anything. Interesting. And so she found him like, of all of the people in the world who could do a ch- a children's program that would matter, it's him. So she said, okay, I'll meet with you. And this is, again, she is supervising students at the University of Pittsburgh, the <laughs> yeah. Pittsburgh School of Theology, and she's still the director of the Arsenal So she's Center. busy. She's a very busy person. <laughs> and she said, you need to come out from behind the camera. She said this, Fred, the children need to see you. They need you to help them distinguish between reality and fantasy. Mm. And I'm going to share a clip with you in a minute that I think really illustrates that. So he took her advice and he began to appear more regularly on screen. And he eventually turned the children's corner into his own show, Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And he also wanted the show to be done really well. When it became his particular show, it was just Mr. Rogers neighborhood He wanted this show to matter and to be important and to have a lasting impact on children. So for him, the most logical step was to ask Dr. Margaret McFarland to become a consultant on the show. Okay. And she happily agreed. And the two of them met weekly for the next 30 years. Oh, my gosh. Weekly? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Can that be us? (laughs) (laughs) She helped him write his shows. Uh, Often her lessons, the things that she said to him, were what he used to create his lessons on the program, the actual lyrics in his songs that he would sing. Like she would change things or she would say, this isn't the right direction for this. And if, if she said that, he would change it because he instinctively understood that she knew more than he did about Mm -hmm. certain things. Wow. What a rare relationship. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're both, I would say, one in a million kind of people Mm -hmm. based on what we know of them. She said this of Fred. He was the most diversely, creatively endowed artist I know. He is a musician, a dramatist, a linguist. Once he chose the field of developing communication with children, his work was all the richer. (laughs) As great of a teacher as Margaret was, Fred was equally a good student. He told you know he he was he would do anything you know he wanted to he wanted to take in what she had to say and be able to turn it into something that children could understand Mm. and he said this about her she will make just one suggestion and it raises the whole level she's a phenomenal gift to those of us who have had the great fortune to work with her she is so giving so generous with her insights and she teaches by parable Hmm. so i'm going to share 
clip of the two of them interacting, and this is probably from the 60s. It's still black and white. Okay. Um, so it's, it's early on in the show, early on in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So the listeners are going to hear the way they interact and how she's gently guiding him and also like really um, complimenting him. Mm-hmm. But I also want you to watch how they interact and describe it when we get when we come back from the clip. And Fred, I think this is the real difference between your program and most uh, television for children. And um, that it is less a show for children and more real communication with them. And I think that's the reason when the children see you, they run up to you and throw their arms around your legs and call you my Mr. Rogers as and anticipate that you would recognize them as they recognize you. And that's the only way I understand that, is that to the child, the television program between you and the child is a real relationship and that you are speaking to the child. Like, I've always felt that that I didn't need to put on a funny hat or jump through the hoop to have a relationship with a child. The thing I feel that, that we have to always have and always remember to keep is that I am an adult in relationship to the child. Uh, not working out some of my old needs in front of a group of children. That's right, that's right. And I think this is a very hard discipline for the person creating programs for children because the creative process is really rooted in your own experiencing of childhood. But to be able to differentiate oneself from the watching child um, is an essential part of making it an adult-child relationship. As soon as the, the television artist becomes a child before the screen, then the adult-child relationship is lost. That was a very intimate-looking scene, just like a true collaboration. It was very gentle. Mm-hmm. I see what you mean about or like from what I've been hearing so far of like her approach with people, it's like you really do listen to her because she's, I don't, it's weird. Like her, her demeanor and like her voice kind of just pull you in Mm -hmm. and make you feel calm. I also was very struck by, even though they are, it feels as though they're colleagues, you know, they're, they're talking about the same thing. Mm Mm-hmm. That moment when she's talking about the differentiation between being able to access your memories as a child versus working something out of your childhood. Which is so responsible. Yeah. Yeah. And he's sitting there taking notes. Mm -hmm. Like, and he has a whole like portfolio laid out in front of him where he's taking notes the entire time she's talking. And I thought that was really profound. Mm -hmm. Like he really is absorbing what she's having to say he really is learning something and i thought that in and of itself was pretty cool because he was considered and still is considered like the king of this this particular kind of expertise Mm -hmm. and here she is teaching him teaching him that yeah it's really cool and just that idea like every i've watched this now this just this two minute clip like probably six or seven times because i'm every single time i'm struck by the profound meaning of what she's saying Mm -hmm. and that, and and I also love what he's saying. Like, I don't have to be a clown. I don't have to become basically a a living cartoon character. Mm -hmm. Children are not as base as a lot of people expect them to be. Well, and, and he, he's really getting at the idea that if I'm putting on a funny hat or doing something silly to make them laugh or for them to feel like they want to watch me, then I've I've given up my role as an adult. Mm-hmm. I have become a, just a bigger child. Yeah, which 
it's not necessarily that that's a bad thing. But that wasn't the goal. But his goal is to really teach Mm -hmm. and help kids communicate. And I guess I didn't really realize until I was doing this research on her that his, basically his stated goal was to help children communicate how they feel. Which is so important because like so many people don't know how to do that. And we're not taught how to do that either. And that's what he was doing was teaching kids how to communicate. And he was doing that at her, like using her Her extensive knowledge. Yeah. And her expertise. So he took what she was saying uh, from an adult's perspective and he would be able to teach it to children. Hmm. And, and again, she would often edit the way that he did things, you know? So here's an example of this. I think this is a really cool story because I had no idea. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, so I've obviously worked with children for a really long time. Yeah. And I have also taken classes in human and childhood development. And I didn't know this. So okay. I'm wondering if you as a mom, if you've had this experience. <laughs> okay. So Fred wanted to talk about fire on the show. Because fire, like, fires are scary. Yeah. And he would often, like, want to talk about things that maybe kids would be afraid of. So he wanted to do an episode about fire. And when he approached Margaret about covering this topic, she told him that before he could talk about fire, he needed to address the control of bodily fluids first. Okay. Do you see a connection between, like, wetting the bed and fires? Um... No. (laughs) Yeah, me neither. I was like, what? So she told him that for children, fire feels very personal. And when they think about it, they think about their own control of their bodily fluids. And I was like, I don't buy this. This is weird. So she told him, you need to talk about this first. The, The two of them in the psyche of a child are connected. And... He took her advice, and so he made a whole bunch of segments about water. He did one uh, looking at the flow of water in a tub. Like, you know, look at how it drains. And Mm -hmm. he showed children how to make dams. So he would have, like, you know how you always had children on a show? They had a stream, and the kids would build a little dam, and they would see how to control your own fluids without actually explicitly saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then they also looked at waterfalls, some of which were, you know, like a waterfall can be really beautiful, but Mm -hmm. also pretty scary, like big ones that are loud. Yeah. So he would talk about that. So then after he'd done all of these things concerning water and how to control water, there was a tiny fire in the town of Make Believe. It was brief. It was like less than 30 seconds. And they didn't show any flames because they didn't want to scare the kids with the fire. Just smoke. And like the little people in the little town of Make Believe were able to put the fire out Mm -hmm. really quickly and without any injury or anything like that. But afterwards, Mr. Rogers received seven complaints about children who had been frightened by it. And each one of them were experiencing urinary issues. Really? So it's like a real thing. I wonder if it's because it's like a almost like a human instinct thing. You know how if animals are afraid, they release their bowels. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's just like primal in that way. I was wondering that too. Is it is it the fear that's causing it or is there something else? Because they were describing it as the fire being personal. Hmm. And that when like when children dream about fire, they they lose control of their peeing i don't know i'd have to go deeper into that isn't that isn't that fascinating yeah um and one thing i just never and you know full disclosure i've never tried to potty train a child (laughs) but i'm in the middle of potty training a dog yeah we have a puppy and the one thing they mentioned was you know for us as adults or as parents we find potty training to be exhausting and frustrating it is but they find it terrifying that it's scary. Yeah. yeah. There, that's why most kids, it's just this utmost like revolt. They don't want to do it. So I had never taken into consideration how scary it must feel to like have to 
do something that you don't understand how your body does in the first place. Mm -hmm. And until I read that, I was like, I would have just not even thought about it from a child's perspective. Mm -hmm. So without Margaret, Mr. Rogers wouldn't have been nearly as effective or as skilled at addressing difficult topics or helping as many kids as he did. Um, colleagues of Fred also said that he often recorded his weekly meetings. So he would take notes like he did in the thing we watched. He would take notes during the meetings and he would often also record it. And then later he would be in his office listening to conversations again, taking more notes and revising his scripts and his songs. Wow. I didn't know that there was so much like professional data behind that show. Yeah. I'm, I guess I assumed there must have been some because it was very effective. Mm -hmm. It did really teach a lot of important lessons. And I don't think you can be an effective teacher if you don't have the right science. Um, Fred Rogers actually said that she was the most major influence of his entire professional life. Wow. So one of Dr. McFarland's most crucial ideas was the concept that attitudes are not taught, they're caught. What does that mean? If a teacher loves what he or she is teaching, then the students will absorb that love. Oh, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, and I think that that, like, she's specifically talking about teaching, and I'm going to tell an anecdote about that in a minute that's really cute. But I think it could be said for also parenting, too. Mm -hmm. Like, if you are taking your kid to go do something that you don't like, <laughs> then they won't like it. Yeah. And and it's just, it just is how it is. Mm -hmm. I actually, so I use that at work a lot. Um, if I have people around me that are feeling blue or if they're feeling like frustrated and upset, I, I try to be more upbeat mm -hmm. and I'll be funny and I'll make them laugh and I'll be like, you know what? It's like, it's going to be okay. Just like not let it get us mad. And I've actually had a couple of times people come up to me and say, thank you for saying that because I was in the hole and, and you helped me out and it pulled, pulled me out. Yeah. I think that I've worked really hard at trying to, trying to be a more positive person because I, it doesn't come naturally to me. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm a little like Eeyore. Um, uh, woe is me. <laughs> uh, so I really like to be around people who, who do that naturally because then it, it encourages me to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe that this adage is true. Mm -hmm. Attitudes are not taught. They're caught. I like that. So to illustrate this once to her students, she had her psychology students watch, observe, right? A sculptor working with children. Okay. So she invited this very famous, very uh, talented sculptor from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, which if you haven't heard of is like one of the best arts universities in the country. It's a private school. And he invited her or he invited, she invited him, this sculptor to come in and work with four and five year olds. And she explicitly told him that he's not to teach them how to sculpt. Okay. That his entire job was to love his clay in front of them. Hmm. And for weeks, that's what he did. The children watched him just have fun with clay just like it like be like oh my gosh look at this cool thing you do i love this clay look at the way it feels and then the kids started just loving it too mm -hmm. and they would not only like pick up the clay and start imitating the kind of love he had for it but it allowed them also to start exploring their own ideas for what to create because they weren't trying to create what he was creating they were trying to create something they loved yeah it just creates a safe place and and that's like their enthusiasm for clay mm -hmm. was based on his enthusiasm for clay. Mm -hmm. And it really taught these students who were observing this that her her thesis that she's telling them is actionable. It's real. You can see it in action. Huh. Which I think is like a cool way to teach anyway. Yeah. Like I'm not just telling you something that's in a textbook or I'm not just telling you something that I've experienced. I'm going to show you the experience of it. Mm-hmm which is just a really great way to teach. Very. Uh, in this way, she was always teaching that real learning only comes from honesty. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you honestly love what you're She's doing. She's like making me uncomfortable. <laughs> 
<laughs> she's too too hitting it she's on the nose. She's hitting it on the nose. Yeah, I'm like literally like starting to feel like a child. <laughs> Maybe that's what Fred Rogers felt like around her. For the like, he was he was kind of child. He whenever I think about Mr. Rogers. He feels sim- like simultaneously both childlike and mm-hmm. very, very much an adult. Yeah. Like I never, conf- I never felt confused about his role. I knew he was an adult and he was an men- he was a mentor, but there was like an innocence and a childlike way about him that made me feel like he understood me. Yeah. And you could trust him. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't weird. Mm-hmm. Even as an adult, when I watch him now... I- I don't think he like there's nothing that for me feels weird about yeah. what he's doing because of what she said. You have to be the adult. Mm-hmm. You still you have to be able to communicate with children on their level, but not in a way that removes you, you as the adult. You go down to being a child or they mm-hmm. get elevated to a, an adult status. Right. Which cr- I, crosses boundaries. Yeah. Love it. And, and And of course, everything he did now that I know this was based on real science on how children communicate and learn. <laughs> so even though this is like she was fucking great at everything she did she hated being recognized really hated being the spotlight never wanted any recognition never wanted anybody to know I'd her be name like take my picture put me on a poster <laughs> give me a book deal <laughs> i know that's why like i'm like what that's why i didn't know who she was i i didn't even know that fred rogers had this person that he was using i thought he just like knew these things <laughs> Well, she was, I feel like in that sense, maybe she was just comfortable being the observer, not the observed. Exactly right. Um, in fact, she just didn't, she didn't want anybody to feel like they had to cater to her and she would go out of her way to do the opposite. She would do things for other people. She loved to cook and she loved to care for others. But I do want to mention that she never got married. She never had children of her own. I was wondering that. I was wondering if she had any no. kids. She she lived in her her childhood home um, until she had to go to a nursing home. So she really just kind of, but she was like super giving with her time. Obviously, I mean the amount of time she spent with Fred Rogers, yeah, <laughs> was a lot. And she was again still the director of this other place and still teaching at Pitt. Um, and in fact, one of her colleagues mentioned that one time. They found out it was her birthday and they were like, oh, we should all go out to lunch and we'll take you out to lunch, Margaret. And she was like, oh, no, she completely dismissed the idea (laughs) and then turned it around and was like, actually, I would love it. You know, what would be great for my birthday. It's if you came to my house. I would love it if you came to my house. And then she did something for them. She cooked them all lunch. Oh, so she made them lunch on her birthday. Because that made her feel good. She Mm -hmm. was like, this is a present to me. I, I, I like to cook for people. It was actually like a real big love of hers was cooking Mm -hmm. and baking. She would bake a lot of cookies. She was actually really, really good at cookies, apparently. Mm, Okay. So she would bake a lot of cookies and bring them to colleagues. Like if anybody had anything to celebrate, she would make them cookies and bring them. (laughs) She was like a really giving person. Yeah. In the latter years of her professional life, she actually started working on some really big, substantial research in the field of child psychology, specifically the development of the ego. Ooh. You know, the id and the ego? Yeah. So previously, it had been widely believed that people didn't start even developing an ego until after the age of three. Okay. That prior to that, the brain was still like too prim- primal. There was no ability to develop this ego. But Margaret believed that the ego started to develop in- at infancy, if not in the womb. And so she started doing research into the development of the human ego, and that went on to become her most notable research and, in fact, informed a lot of what we know about ego to this day in children, which informed, obviously, how we teach them and how we work with them and how we treat them for problems. In the late 1970s, she was diagnosed with a rare bone marrow disorder called myelofibrosis. Mm. It's basically chronic leukemia. Oh, it's really bad and it's super painful. Yeah. It requires frequent blood transfusions, which are really uncomfortable and mm-hmm. painful. She lived with the disease for nearly 10 years before succumbing to it on September 12th, 1988. She was 83 years old. Oh. 
Despite the many years of work she had uh, on childhood development and psychology, she didn't leave much behind as far as her legacy. Instead, her legacy lives on in her students and in the families she counseled and the ones she worked with at Arsenal, the Child and Family Center that she obviously co-founded with Eric Erickson yeah. and Benjamin Spock. And that center continues to serve families and children today, more than 60 years later. Wow. Within a year of her passing, her friends and colleagues created the Margaret McFarland Fund, which focuses on funding projects and programs that benefit children six and under. It still exists. That's cool. It still funds children programs. And in 2015, the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media decided to start a project to analyze all of those recorded conversations between Dr. McFarland and Fred. Oh, that would be awesome. And they, what their goal is, is to try to learn more about how these talks helped inform Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So there's no doubt, obviously, that despite the fact that she wasn't a household name and didn't have famous books or anything like that, that Dr. Margaret McFarlane impacted the lives of thousands of children and family around the world, including Australia. <laughs> Her research and teachings actually still form the foundation of many of our beliefs about teaching, child rearing and how to care for children with trauma. And her influence, obviously, on Fred Rogers also means that virtually every American child who was raised between 1967 and 2001 learned invaluable lessons about acceptance, fear, kindness, honesty, friendship, Mm -hmm. and most importantly, love. (laughs) So I'm going to leave you with one final quote about Dr. Margaret McFarland. This is what Fred Rogers had to say about who she was as a person and as a teacher. She was a once in a lifetime teacher. Anyone who had her for a teacher would not have forgotten her. In her presence, you seem to be able to do more, think more, feel more, understand more than you ever dreamed you could. Wow. That's so beautiful. Don't you feel a little warm and fuzzy? I do. I feel a little teary. I feel loved. (laughs) I feel a little teary about this one. Yeah. I didn't expect that. So I really went back in time for some of these stories. Yeah. Because I... The whole reason it was sparked was because, remember, uh, we met for drinks afterwards with Eric and we did, yeah. Mike, at, and we ended up talking about Mr. Rogers. We did. And I had him on my mind because of that conversation we had about, mm-hmm. you know, his influence and his impact. And this week, I had a, I, I read the New York Times, and they did an overlooked obituary on her and it was her Mm -hmm. oh and it was like this feels right Mm -hmm. because we were just talking about it so it just felt right Mm -hmm. and so I I did decide to do this even though I felt like oh well now everybody's you know everybody's gonna read this overlooked thing and this episode's not gonna matter but that's why I decided to go way back and actually read Mm -hmm. so much stuff so let me tell you about some of the stuff I read (laughs) okay uh, even Mr. Rogers learns about her, uh, or learns from her about children, which was by Ann Butler for the Pittsburgh press in 1987. Oh, geez. <laughs> I had, to, I had to pay for this shit. Oh no. Um, same with, I read her, um, her obituary in the Pittsburgh post Gazette from September 30th, 1988. Part of the reason why I really wanted to get these old, um, articles from Pittsburgh is mm-hmm. that outside of Pittsburgh, She just wasn't well known. Yeah. And so it it was important to me that I read the profile from then Mm -hmm. because it was going to be a little more accurate. Um, uh, So then obviously I used the Overlooked No More, Margaret McFarlane, The Mentor to Mr. Rogers by Christina Karen for New York Times. In the Land of Make-Believe, The Real Mr. Rogers by Paul Hendrickson for The Washington Post from 1982. There was a profile on mrrogers.org, which is where that video clip came from. Five Lessons from Margaret McFarland, The Scientist Behind Mr. Rogers, by Lara Vinopal for Fatherly Magazine. When Fred Met Margaret, by Sally Ann Flecker for Pit Med. And this is actually a podcast. I wasn't oh. able to find it, but there should be a podcast out there called When Fred Met Mar- Margaret. Uh, I obviously wanted to find out what the Margaret McFarland Fund was, so I looked that up and also used Wikipedia. Very nice. I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I had no idea. 
I didn't either. I just thought Mr. Rogers was like... I just thought Mr. Rogers was Mr. Roger. <laughs> I just thought he just knew shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You ready for mine? I am really ready. So today I'm going to be talking about Susan LaFleche Picotti. I think I know her. I was wondering if you did. I think she's on my list. She's Native American, isn't she? She's the first Native American... She's the first Native American woman to become a doctor. Yes. Okay. I've Okay. I've definitely read her entire thing and I was going to do her, but I was like, there's so much. There just, was so much. <laughs> I decided to put her off. I, I've done this like four times. I've like put her on my list and then put her off because the amount of information was so overwhelming mm-hmm. that I was like, I'm just going to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I, do that for I summertime. I went through it and I picked out so that we wouldn't be here forever. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. There is so much. It was some time and it was some reading. So Susan was born in June 1865 in a teepee on the Omaha Reservation in eastern Nebraska. Both her parents were multiracial and of European and Native American descent, but they culturally identified as Omaha Mm -hmm. since they were born and raised on the Omaha Reservation. And they both actually, they both spoke Omaha as well. Her father, Joseph, who was also called Iron Eye, was of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska and also half French Canadian. He left the reservation to get an education in St. Louis, Missouri, but he returned um, when he was done with his education. He returned to the reservation. Um, Her father was actually adopted by the chief, uh, Chief Young Elk, in 1853, and her dad was chosen as this chief's successor. Mm. So naming him like the principal leader of the Omaha tribe in 1855. Her mother's name was Mary Gale, and she was a mix of the Omaha Auto Iowa heritage. Um, She actually, her mother, so Mary's father was an American army surgeon and her step, she was the stepdaughter of a prominent fur trader. So her parents come from quite an impressive background. Yeah. So like Joseph, Mary identified as Omaha. Uh, She was fluid in French and English, but she refused to speak any other language than Omaha in their home. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Susan was the youngest of four girls. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a trend happening. I know. And she had one older half brother. I was a little confused, but it seemed like obviously her dad had been married a couple times. Okay. Her parents insisted that Susan learn the tribe's traditional songs, uh, their beliefs, customs, traditions, and the language in order to, um, like they said, retain her Omaha identity. But they felt strongly that these these Native rituals were not going to help her in the world that they were currently living in. They still wanted her to know them, but they were just, they wanted to make sure that she had even more kind of in her Mm -hmm. pocket. So they decided to send her to a Presbyterian mission school on the reservation. There she learned English and she became a devout Christian. Because, of course, that's what they always yeah. do on those reservations. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> the assimilation. The assimilation, which was based on what Australia did. So cool. <laughs> and we've talked about that before. Yes. Um, they actually, this is kind of sad to me. They didn't give her an Omaha name because they didn't think that she'd be, she would benefit from it. You know, there's that's a similar thing that ends up happening sometimes to um, children of recent immigrants mm-hmm. to the United States. They want their children, maybe not now as much, yeah. But back in the day, when people would immigrate here, they would want their children to be accepted as fully um, quote unquote American. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, like that, like I I remember having students who were like Vietnamese or Chinese or something and they would their real names quote unquote real names would be like a traditional name and then they would go by like Susie mm-hmm. which had nothing to do with their name. well it's the same like in my both sides of my family my parents and their siblings all go by very Americanized names mm. my mom's name is San Juana she goes by Jane I didn't know that yeah that's my mom's full I thought name her name was actually Jane no <laughs> what about your name then? Uh, my name is, it's Rita. Okay. Like, I don't have a shortened or anything, but like um, my father-in-law, Carlos, um, everybody from back in the day calls him Charlie. And I'm like, oh, so how do you know Carlos? And like, oh, me and Charlie go back to, and yeah. So he went as Charlie. He went by Charlie? Yeah. And like Jose, they go as Joe. 
Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. It always it always like makes me a little sad. It it is. It's that I understand, mm-hmm. but it still doesn't stop sucking. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't doesn't erase the fact that like there was a a concerted effort to try to like not be who you are. Yeah. And I understand or at least not be parents, recognizable. I understand where her parents were coming from there. Though. Yeah. It's like they were living through a time where they were being wiped out. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, how do we get them to serve? How do we get these generations to survive? It's, yeah. It's all about survival, right? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> if your name is like some unpronounceable native name on a sheet of paper when you're applying for a job or this other person's name is Susan. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, racism exists. We live here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, they actually prevented her, too, from receiving traditional tattoos that were going that go across the women's foreheads. Oh, yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> she spoke Omaha with her parents, but her father and her oldest sister, Suzette, encouraged her to speak English outside the house and with her other siblings. Mm. So only Omaha with mom and dad. Yeah, and well, that's, again, very similar to the immigrant experience Mm -hmm. for a lot of people who can speak their, you know, home, like, language at home, but not out in the public. Which is very sad. Yeah. So Iron Eagle sought to help his people by encouraging, he encouraged the assimilation because um, he really did believe that it was necessary for them to adapt to the white waves or white ways so that they could survive. Mm -hmm. And he caused a stir with the Omaha people because he was participating in that land allotment. Oh, that we talked about. Yes. Yeah. With the, the lawyer. Yeah. Who argued in front of the Supreme court. So the allotments are, as Amanda knows, it's like, those acres of land that get held and then auctioned off piece by piece are allowing people to come and live on them. It's not their land. Well, it's supposed to be. The idea was you get this little spot over here, you Mm -hmm. get this spot. But then if you were not living on that land, then it would be up for auction or Mm -hmm. people could just literally move onto it. White people, obviously. Yeah. Could just move onto it and start it and call it theirs. It was, it was real shitty. So he was, he was kind of allowing this to happen and not trying to stir the water. And people obviously were getting upset at eight years old. Susan was assisting her mother at the bedside of an elderly native woman. The woman was extremely sick and she needed medical attention. The doctor had been called four times and each time he said that he was on his way. Mm. He never came and the woman died in extreme pain and discomfort. And Susan said that even as a young girl, the message was clear. It was only an Indian. Ugh. And that sparked something inside Susan that she said one day she wanted to heal the fellow members of her Omaha tribe. This is a quote from Susan. She said, it has always been a desire of mine to study medicine ever since I was a small girl. For even then I saw the need of my people for a good physician. Because like the white doctors wouldn't even want to touch the native oh, people. Oh, I know. There was like this perception that they were dirty. Yeah. It was uh, it the the racism. Yeah. There was... Do, doing this research, there was such a focus on hygiene. Mm. And it was just like, like almost to the point where it was like, you're dirty, you're dirty, you're dirty. When you say that, who who was such a focus? What are you referring the, to? We'll get into it. Okay. So at the age of 14, she was sent east to attend an all-girls school in Elizabeth, New Jersey, mm. to be followed by uh, the school called Virginia's Hampton Institute, where she took classes with children of former slaves and other Native American children. She graduated from the Hampton Institute on May 20th, 1886, where she was the class salutorian. Salutatorian. Salutatorian. What is that? Number two. Number two. Valedictorian is number one. Salutatorian is number two. That's what I figured. She was awarded the DeMoris Prize which was given to the graduating senior who received the highest scores in their exams. Uh, A lot of the graduates from that school, especially the women were encouraged to teach or to return to the reservation. And especially for the women, be good wives, go to church, have babies. (laughs) Uh, What what was that we were talking about the other day? Like women had the options of like being a teacher, (laughs) a nurse, A secretary. secretary. (laughs) And that was basically it. A or B. Where do you want to go? She decided she wanted to apply to medical school. Go get it. Yeah. So 
Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to receive a medical degree. Mm-hmm. This was in 1849. This talking about Susan getting applying to medical school is 45 years later. Yeah. And it's still very rare for women to be doing this. Of course it is. Yeah. So in the late 19th century, only a few schools um, accepted women as medical students. And so Susan applied and was accepted to one of them. It was the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, the WMCP, which was established in 1850 and one of, I believe it was three medical schools on the East Coast that would allow women. You know, it's funny. So we both had women who were in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hmm. There's that thread. Hmm. So medical school was expensive and Susan could not afford it on her own. So she turned to a family friend of hers named Alice Fletcher. Alice was a ethnographer. Hmm. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah, those are the people who like mapped ethnicities. Yeah, it's a branch of anthropology which links to sociology, and it's a detailed observation of people in their natural environment. Yeah, yeah. it was often real shitty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, not everybody who did it was shitty, but it was a lot of what ended up coming out of the people who did those studies it was, was shitty. It was like eugenics. Yeah. It was real bad. <laughs> They'd be like, see, see, I told you, people of color are dumb. Yeah. Like, they had this, their brain is smaller. Like it was, <laughs> yep. It was real terrible. So this family friend of hers, Alice had connection with a lot of women's reform organizations. And Susan had once helped nurse Alice back to health when she had a flare up of inflammatory rheumatism. So Alice felt like it was her turn to help Susan. So she had, she helped Susan um, appeal to the women's national Indian association And Susan sent in writing her desire to enter the homes of people as a physician and teach them hygiene as well as curing their ills. So this group, I don't know how I feel about this group. It it was a group of white women that were sitting on this platform and they were, they were handing out scholarships and they were handing out help, but it was for the fact that they could say, see the white people are helping these people become good citizens in the world like it well it also feels very um like patronizing very like i'm gonna give you this money but now you're gonna do this thing i want you to do and if you don't do this thing you want i want you to do you won't get the money yeah like that's it's pretty gross and this group like was really intense on they wanted to teach native women hygiene and how to and like a lot of domestic stuff so like how to properly present yourself and how to sew and how to do like to act more Americanized in that way, you know, put a corset on Mm. and sit in a chair and embroider kind of thing. The hygiene thing. I think I understand. Um, cause there was this movement in the United States at the time. Okay. Where suddenly we understood that you should wash your hands Mm -hmm. in order to prevent the spread of disease. Yes. So, um, that education wasn't necessarily getting everywhere it needed to go. Okay. So they needed people to be communicating and teaching these. Tactics. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's similar to like, we take for granted that like, we can just walk into a grocery store and buy tampons. True. And there are places still in the, in the world where that's like having a period by itself means that you have to go sit in a period hut mm-hmm. for seven days and bleed all over yourself. Mm-hmm. Because they think it's gross and weird. Yeah. It's just that kind of like, I'm not saying that that's what was happening, but there's this idea here that like, if if you just understood that this was totally normal, maybe you wouldn't feel this way. But there's still like, I think this is such a touchy subject because mm-hmm. what we think is quote unquote right or correct or normal doesn't mean that it is for anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a good idea to tell people to wash their hands. I think it's just in general, I feel it, that like it should be practiced. It's just like everybody can learn that. And I don't feel weird about it. <laughs> <laughs> wash your hands. <laughs> don't get pink eye from my dog. Yeah. Well, <laughs> her dog does have pink eye right now. It's gross. <laughs> so this association also requested that she remain single during her time in medical school. See, they, now, uh, 
I don't like this. Like, you don't get to tell people how to live their life. Yeah. Just because you're giving them money. Money. Ugh. Yeah. So she did in order to stay in school. And for several years after her graduation, um, she stayed single in order to focus on her practice. Mm-hmm. So in school, she studied chemistry, anatomy, physiology, histology, uh, pharmaceutical science, obstetrics, and general medicine. She did clinical work at facilities in Philadelphia, and she was doing these both along alongside men and other women, which mm-hmm. I think is really cool. Um, there was note in there while attending medical school, she decided to change her appearance slightly um, in the way that she dressed, in the way that she did her hair, in the way that she presented herself. She said she wanted to be like them. She wanted to look like them okay, so that they would accept her. So what does that mean? How did she change? What did she do? Well, it, the way that they said it, she tightened back her hair. She wore mm-hmm. the the style that the other, the white girls were wearing. And so she was trying to fit in in that way. Mm. Um, I don't think she changed appearance in a way of like changing her features. No, she, I thought maybe you were saying like she dyed her hair or oh, something no. like that. But still, if that's not how you would have dressed. I don't know. That's a hard one though. Like I think like, once you become part of a different cultural group, whether that's moving somewhere or whatever, mm-hmm. you just sort of look, start looking different. Like when I, when I moved to Bozeman, <laughs> true. Um, you know, what, where I grew up in Montana, everybody wore like Levi's and cowboy boots and whatever. And I never did. That was just not how I dressed. Mm-hmm. And when I moved to Bozeman, everybody wore like Carhartts and flannels and, outdoor gear and whatever and I definitely liked that look (laughs) it's like when I arrived um at school freshman year and everyone had adidas and I was like I guess I need to go to adidas (laughs) yeah so some of that's some of that's like I think a natural part of becoming a different group Mm -hmm. like being in a different group but then some of it is obviously based in racism and and trying to fit in yeah, yeah and wanting to assimilate yeah which I mean her parents had encouraged her to do yeah everybody did it sounded like So while in her second year of school, there was a huge measles outbreak back at home on where she's from on her reservation. Susan immediately went back home to see if she could help. It was seriously contagious. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge risk for her to do that, to come and help provide aid. Um, Luckily, while she was providing aid, she did not, like she didn't get measles. So thank goodness. She was able to return to school and keep up with her studies. And she actually kept in contact with her tribe through letters, still giving them medical advice. And so they would write her and say this and this and this happened. So she was helping them through letters, which I think is pretty, pretty nice. She went on to graduate at the top of her class of 36 women on March 14th, 1889. And she was named valedictorian. After graduating, she applied for the position of government physician in Omaha Agency Indian School. Yeah. Um, she received the job two months later. And it kind of seemed like from what I was reading that as she was applying for the job, they had heard of her and they were getting ready to offer her the job. So but, like kind of cross paths in that way, which I think is really neat. Couldn't you imagine going in for an interview and they're like, oh, yeah, we were going to. We were all going to pick you. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming in. You, you got the picked. job. <laughs> Um, she, this too, part of the organization that gave her the money to go to school, they asked her to go on a speaking tour at the request of, uh, the Connecticut Indian Association to make a presentation assuring white audiences that Indians could benefit from white civilization. Mm. Right? No. So not like you said, I'm going to give you this money. And now you have to do this thing. And now you have to do this thing. This thing where I am the hero. Yeah. That white savior complex is <laughs> strong in this one. Yep. So she keeping ties with the association and she went on the speaking tour. They further sponsored her by funding the purchase of medical instruments for her, books for her, and... um Kind of getting her on her feet when, when she was in her first years of practice. I am so conflicted about this shit. Me too. Like, if if they hadn't been helping her, she couldn't have done the good things. But the help that they're offering is really... It's... Like, it's... Yeah, it's way. dirty. Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't I'm like sure it. she didn't like it either. <laughs> well, and I, and I kind of wonder about that. Like, 
we're looking back on this from a 21st century lens where we understand a lot more. True. She might have just thought these are really benevolent people. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Like without her compared to the ones who are killing in you know Native Americans. Like at least there's. (sighs) This is a whirlwind of emotion. (laughs) It is. It's really awful. I hate it. She was. She ended up being the sole doctor for 1,244 patients that spread over a territory of about 13,000 square miles. Whoa, that is a lot of territory to cover. So she made house calls, and they were tedious and tiresome. She would push herself sometimes for 20-hour workdays. She would wrap herself in her buffalo robe and drive her buggy through the snow sometimes through sub-zero winds with Mm. her two mares. Uh, The mares' names were Pat and Pudge, which I love. (laughs) I'm glad that you went into your research enough to know what the horses' names were. That's (laughs) really like hashtag Rita. (laughs) Um, But could you imagine just like most of that time is spent in travel? Oh, that would be awful. It's not even like she has someone driving her where maybe she could take a nap. Being from rural Montana... And understanding what that really means in terms of the weather and how far apart everything is. Like, I feel that in my literal bones. I feel that cold and that traveling. It'd just be awful. She became known as Dr. Sue and her office hours never ended. Even when she slept, she would leave a lantern in her window so that if anybody needed help, they knew that they were welcome. Oh, that's really great. Uh, one of her many platform, or one of her main platforms, was hygiene and um, illness prevention. Mm-hmm. She also believed strongly in the healing power of fresh air and sunshine. She openly spoke out against white men selling whiskey, drawing attention to the fact that they were purposely preying on tribe members. Mm-hmm. Um, she, as they were, they really, really, they were. really were. Yeah, people like the, some of the elders and most people. Did not trust the white doctors. As they shouldn't. As they shouldn't. No. And they would flock to Susan because not only was she one of them, she spoke their language. Yeah. I mean, like, (laughs) obviously. (laughs) Yeah. In 1894, Susan married Henry Bacotti. He was a Sioux from South Dakota, and the two had two boys. Um, At that time, Susan was expected to become a full-time mom and a homemaker, and she broke that stereotype by staying uh, full time at her job. Well, if she had d- decided to become a stay at home mom, that's fine. But mm-hmm. who would those people have for a doctor? Yeah, white guys who are probably going <laughs> to not give a shit and let them die anyway. Give them proper care. God, no, um, no good, no thank you. She did suffer a constant struggle with her decision, though. She was really torn between mm. serving those people and her community and taking care of her husband and her children. Um, she had a constant fear of spreading herself too thin mm. and not being the best doctor, mother, and a wife that she possibly could be. That sounds like it could have been written about 2020. Yeah. I mean, I don't know a woman who works like a long, high-powered job or whatever who also doesn't feel like they're they're sacrificing some of their time with their family. Mm-hmm. And that they're I, not enough in any aspect. And I just don't think men have to... Very often. I think it's getting better, but especially then, men didn't have to face that choice. No, there was no choice. There was one way. Yeah. And it was acceptable to not be around. Sadly, too, things that her in her home started to fall apart. Um, Her her husband actually began to struggle with alcoholism. Mm. Um, He contracted tuberculosis and combined with excessive drinking, he died in 1905, leaving Susan a widow with their two small boys. She was only 40 at this time. That is the year that Margaret McFarlane was born. Really? Can you imagine these two having overlapping lives? Because like her story sounds like it could be a million years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm and by her, I mean Susan's. Like Margaret's sounded very now. Yeah. It is really bizarre. That they're in the same lifetime? Yes. That they, <laughs> they had overlapping lives. Yeah. Because, you know, we're talking about him dying of tuberculosis in 1905. Mm-hmm. And she was born in 1905? Yeah. Wow. In a suburb of Pittsburgh. Wow. <laughs> right? Like, this is, like, gigantically d- different. Drastic stories. And, and and it just goes to show that you can be living in the same country and have, like, the amount of wealth and technology that the East Coast had versus where everyone else lived. True. 
it's just different. It's so mind boggling to me. After her husband's death, Susan began suffering from chronic pain and respiratory issues. Um, she didn't let it slow her down, though. Uh, she helped build and open a hospital near Walt Hill, Nebraska in 1903. This was the first facility to be built on a reservation land without any support from the federal government. Oh, that's amazing. First one ever. She established that hospital. She said it was open to anyone that was ill, no matter their age, no matter their gender, no matter their skin color. She also became a political advocate for the Omaha people. Uh, Many of the natives were being financially taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And like we said, with the land allotments and things like that, uh, she actually helped uh, draw attention to illegal land sales. And she even traveled to D.C. to speak as a representative of her people. Um, Her health continued to decline. And in March 1915, she was diagnosed. um, She was suffering from a bone cancer. Mm -hmm. which is another shadow. Yeah. Very similarity. She ended up dying on September 18th, 1915. She was only 53 years old. That's quite young. Her service was held the next day and she was buried in Bancroft cemetery in Nebraska. She was next to her husband, her father, her mother and her sisters and her brother who had all passed away before her. Oh my God. So She lost all of those people during this time. Yeah. Her whole family. Yeah. Her son, Carl Picotti, became a, he actually got a career with the U.S. Army, and he served in World War II. She had another son, Pierre, who stayed in Nebraska for his whole life, and he raised his family with three kids there. Susan's Hospital in Walt Hill, Nebraska, is still there today, mm-hmm. and it's a community center. It's named after her and was actually declared um, a National Historic Landmark in 1993. However, doing a little bit more research, um, I found the facility because I wanted to see what it looked like. And in 2018, the hospital was named one of the one of 11 of the most endangered places in 2018. Like that's falling apart. Oh, so it hasn't been kept up. It hasn't been kept up. And so I read an article that said they had put a new roof on and it wasn't totally sealed up and they had these heavy rains. That the roof is literally, it's like a bomb dropped through it because you know how it gets wet and then it just breaks. And then it caves in. And then all of the walls are just stained and it just, the place is in disarray. Oh, that's disappointing. Um, So there actually is a website that I found. It is the drsusancenter.org and they are raising money to fix the facility. Um, They were just recently, I think it was October of last year, given a $50,000 grant, which is going to help restore her hospital but also that on that website you can donate you to can that donate facility. Mm-hmm. and the facility is a place for um omaha people it gives resources and things for them to be able to reach out to well so, we'll we'll make sure to put the link to the website on our facebook and um in our instagram in the comments yes uh, there's also an elementary school in western omaha nebraska that's named after her um, on her 152nd anniversary of her birth, she was the Google Doodle. The Google Doodle. <laughs> the Google Doodle. The Google Doodle. <laughs> I love Google Doodle, though. <laughs> and a bust of Susan was dedicated at the Martin Luther King Jr. Transportation Center in Sioux City. So I got most of my information from Wikipedia. Uh, History.com, there is... Um, it's called Remembering the First Native American Doctor by Christopher Klein. Uh, the article that I read about um, her her hospital being in disarray was from the SiouxCityJournal.com. And I got a lot of information from a book written by Joe Starita. It's called A Warrior of the People, How Susan LaFleche Overcame Racial and Gender Inequality to Become America's First Indian Doctor. Lovely. I'm so glad you did her so that I can cross her off the list. <laughs> Cause for real. So there, there I have a, I have probably like four women that are on my like rotation where I, every week I'm like, I'm going to do her, but I'm like, Oh, I don't have time to do that much research. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm really grateful you did that because she's so important. She is very important. And she dedicated her life to just the betterment of her people, which I always admire people who, 
their their fingers their their works reach further far and wide because of the amount of people that they help that goes on for generations yeah for sure just like your lady yeah margaret mcfarland Mm -hmm. i'm really happy with our girls today me too our ladies um i just want to make sure that y'all know that you can follow us on instagram twitter and facebook we post photos and other information about our ladies every week um and we also want to thank our editor lucas mcintyre who does a fantastic job making us sound good, especially in my very echoey office that we still need to make better. And uh, we also want to thank Jennifer Finch of L7. Especially, you should go listen to them. Because they kick ass. They're really kick ass. (laughs) And thank you for listening. Thank you, guys. Until next time. Bye.